first five pages of a story I wrote this spring um, called You Have a Friend in 10A. Um, okay. I'm told I went catrastic for the first time in 1984. Oh, sorry. I also want to say that this first paragraph is kind of intense. We're going to get through it together. <laughs> and then we'll be fine after that. Okay. I'm told I went catrastic for the first time in 1984 when Jerome Shin, yes, the director, took me up to my bathroom, my gaudy childhood bathroom with big pink jacuzzi and mirrors on all four walls, cut me my first line, and asked me to hold his balls while he jacked off. <laughs> the request was casual, like my stepmother telling me to hold her purse while she fixed her lipstick. <laughs> Just hold them, I said. <laughs> Yeah, he said, pulling down the top of my dress and looking skeptically at my half-grown tits. Just hold them. The pouch sat on my palm like rotten fruit while he worked his sad, skinny dick. It was a year or so after his young wife drowned. He must have been in his early 40s then. I was 14. Now tug them, he barked, scrunching up his face. Startled, I tugged until he came onto my thigh in the hem of my dress, my stepmother's dress. I returned it to her closet without cleaning it. My father's party murmured through the floor in the pipes. All those people milling around, trying to outfabulous each other, talking about green lights and opening grosses and sex. Probably every bathroom in the house was hosting some variation on our theme. Jerome cast me in his next movie. My agent said we had to change my name. No one uses their real name, he said, and yours is terrible. We were at the Polo Lounge. He was eating a cob salad. He reached over with his fork and knocked my hand away from my fries. Actors' names are just labels you stick on a fantasy, he said. You know, like Armani or something. But it would be nice to keep some reference to your father. So I went from being Allison Lowenstein Carr to being Carr Allison. It's a no-brainer, my agent told me. Just go with it. <laughs> in retrospect, I don't think I felt contrastic in the bathroom with Jerome. I remember feeling flattered and grossed out and high and sophisticated. Still, my helpers identified that night as when my, as when my system first became seriously susceptible to degradons, when I started to lose track of my esteem. Jerome, they told me, was a usurper, which I've never quite been able to sort out, because Jerome's movie is what made me famous, and the church only ever liked me because I was famous. Jefferson Morris himself told me that the founder says the important moments in life aren't just points along a single straight line, but are moving, swiveling hubs within a three-dimensional web and belong to multiple trajectories, both ascending and descending. So, when I held Jerome's balls, I was beginning my descent into fucked up druggy despectum, but I'd also hooked into that steep, skyward line that would bring me to Griffith and Jefferson and the teachings of the founder. But then there was everything else, too. Like I said, I can't sort it out. Businessman, computer businessman, Steelers fan, Asian grandmother, clean-cut guy who's probably a pervert, sullen punk kid, black guy with big gold jewelry, retired couple with too much luggage, harried couple with too many children, Texan. They file past my seat, departing souls taking slow zombie steps down a fluorescent tunnel. Well, I guess it's hurry up and wait, a middle-aged lady says to no one in particular. We're all in this together, she's saying. The flight attendants want to take our bags away. They want us to sit when we want to stand. They sport with our sanity. But I like the flight attendants. Their big hair and sexy blue vests and shiny red nails. The guy in the middle seat doesn't seem to recognize me, which is just as well. I look out the window at the odd vehicles racing around the tarmac at the shadowy people behind the terminal windows, at the transparent flutter of jet exhaust. <coughs> I am going to my mother's house, an act of desperation. The last time I saw her, three years ago, we got in a fight before I could even get through the door. Where's Helena? With Griffith. You left her with that loon? Don't even talk to me about leaving, and he's not a loon. He's a loon. Him and that Jefferson Starship guy and their Looney Tunes religion. It's my religion, too. It's not a religion. It's a roach motel for idiots. You don't know. You don't know anything about the founder. You're just a blip. What's a blip? Someone who doesn't know anything about the founder. <laughs> <laughs> You're brainwashed. You're a Nazi. And then she slammed the door in my face. 
and I lifted up the metal flap of the mail slot and hollered through it that she was a cunt and a usurper, and I hope she and her degradants had a very nice life together. <laughs> but now I've left the church, or the church has left me, or we left each other, and Griffith of course left me, and Quentin is dead, and I spent all my money trying to get Helena back and failed, and I tried to be in a play, and my friends finally, nicely, suggested I should look for my own place to live. I'm in coach but near the front, and I see a tall man in a white uniform take a seat in first class. My heart flies up like a flush dove, but gets caught and tangled in a net. If I were hooked up to an orograph, it would be going crazy. I remind myself that Quentin is dead. Most everyone's settled down and buckled up now, except for a paunchy guy who's trying to break the plane apart with his oversized suitcase, his round belly assaulting the face of the woman in the aisle seat sweat stains in his armpits. A flight attendant comes and splays her red nails across the suitcase as though calming a frightened animal. She lifts it down and takes it away. The pilot comes out of the plane's little locked brain and shakes the hand of the man in white, bending down, nodding and somber as they exchange a few words. There are all kinds of stories. The church bought me for Griffith. He's gay, I'm gay. I was impregnated with the founder's frozen sperm. I was impregnated by Jefferson Morris. I was impregnated by Quentin. I was never pregnant at all. I'd been out of Cloud Vista for only a couple of months when my agent called, all excited. Griffith Jacks wants a meeting. Wear something classy, don't swear, be sugar sweet, and try not to act like a junkie. What's the script, I ask? Who, does the, fuck, who the fuck cares? Aren't you coming? He wants to meet you alone, they specified. Griffith is not tall, but he wasn't as short as I expected. He moved around his office with the same gymnastic energy as the command of squirrels I watched out the window at Cloud Vista while they leapt and dangled and corkscrewed, raiding the bird feeders. He has small, active hands, and I imagined an invisible tail whirling behind him as he poured me a glass of mineral water, then darted to the window to point out a jet taking off from Santa Monica. I've been thinking about getting one like that myself. What do you think? Do you like it? then fiddled with papers on his desk, then flopped down beside me on a long white couch and unleashed his grin. Everyone knows Griffith's smile, but you can't really understand its effect until you're confronted by it in person. You lean toward those teeth, swim upstream, struggle closer to the origin of all that dazzle, that gush of stardust. Suddenly, I was Suzanne in Tin Can Palace. I was that bitchy lawyer in pleadings who doesn't want to be charmed by him but is. I wasn't a washed up 20 year old with a pill problem. I was inside a glorious sphere of light. It was a glorious sphere of light. You, he said, you are special. I can tell. I've always liked you on screen, but now, talking to you in person, just sitting here looking at you, he broke off and gave his famous trill of incredulous laughter. Just look at you, he said, taking my hand. You just, you, you have so much to give. There's something about you. I didn't expect to react this way. I mean, I wasn't planning, but just look at you. I echoed his laugh and tried to amp up my smile. My smile is not my strong suit, though. And remembering that, I faltered and looked away. I put a fing he put a finger under my chin and turned my face back. And you've still got a sweet shyness, he said. Great, really great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just so happy to meet you. Yeah? He shook his head and laughed again, staring at me, giddy. Yeah? Am I crazy here? Are you feeling this car? Because I'm feeling something, something big. <laughs> I had to turn away again. On a side table stood a framed picture of a young man in a white uniform with gold braid and rows of colorful ribbons. Is that your son? I asked, knowing it was. Quentin was the product of Griffith's first marriage to his high school sweetheart. After her, he married an ethereal movie star, and after her, he married a model from Ecuador. And after her, he married me. Quentin, yeah, my boy. He sprang off the couch and picked up the photo, staring at it for a moment before he dropped back beside me. Closer now, our thighs touching. I felt thrilled and twisted. I felt something big. I felt like I was a shred of myself caught on a sharp hook, but also like I was a gust of wind. I felt desperate to get high and certain I would never be, want to be high again. I didn't know he was in the Navy, I said, looking at Quentin's face, which was a distorted version of Griffith's square bullet of masculinity. He's not, 
Griffiths took my hand. Listen, Carr, do you ever feel like you need help? What do you mean? Don't act like a junkie. Don't act like a junkie. <laughs> do you ever have doubts? Do you ever worry about rejection? Do you feel like there are people trying to bring you down? I thought about the blandly handsome men in suits who had greeted me in the lobby and ridden with me in the elevator to Griffith's office. They had asked after my father and stepmother by name. I said they'd moved to Hawaii and opened a Zen center, but the men already knew. With a pair of synchronized winks, they mentioned an interview I gave when I was 17 in which I had said I wanted to marry Griffith. I just got out of rehab, I said to Griffith, so yeah. <laughs> his dark eyebrows squeezed his forehead into a rift of concern. His gaze fried me like an ant in the light through a magnifying glass. Just when the tension was about to break me, he said softly, I can help you. <laughs> <laughs>